Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And it's not easy to run out of things to entertain ourselves with in the world, or region, of Skyrim. Get bored killing dragons? Well, kill some bandits. Killed all the bandits? See how much you can rob from a shop when you put a basket on its owner's head. There's limitless possibilities when it comes to making your own fun in Skyrim. Well, today, we're going to take another look at a few of them you still may not have known about as we go over five more things you probably didn't know you could do in The Elder Scrolls V. Part 3. Starting off, the flame spell is usually the first the player is ever exposed to and uses. It's automatically unlocked by your character at the game start in Helgen, and it does some pretty decent damage, at least considering your level then. Additionally, it causes prolonged burning damage to targets, and may even hold the best magicka to damage ratio out of any spell in the game, dealing 8 points of damage a second in exchange for just 14 magicka per second. And besides, who doesn't want the ability to shoot fire out of their hands? Well, despite the spell's objective usefulness and wide exposure, it has a small quirk that the player can exploit that's gone unnoticed by most. Equip the spell and just lightly tap on your trigger or triggers, depending on which or both of your hands have it equipped. But again, just tap the triggers. Don't actually hold down the buttons or their PC equivalents long enough for you to start casting the spell in full. Well, if you do this long enough, you'll eventually notice that the lingering flame animation in your hands will grow exponentially. This will be visible in both first and third person camera angles. The increased flame size will not affect the spell's stats in any way. It won't cost more or less magicka to cast, nor will it do any more or less damage. There's actually a bit of discussion I saw over on Reddit regarding whether or not this increase in the animation size is a result of a glitch or an intentional detail added in by Bethesda. Regardless, it's definitely worth a try. Next on our list, Arondil is an Altmer necromancer living out his days in the ancient Nordic ruins of Yingvild. We've discussed this curious figure before on this channel, and he has a rather horrifying backstory. According to various journals you can find throughout Yingvild, Arondil was originally a resident of Dawnstar, who spent his days lusting after many of the girls his age in the town. However, his advances were universally rejected, and he was widely regarded as a bit of a creep. Eventually, he was also found out to be practicing necromancy, and had to flee the settlement to avoid being arrested. That's when he found Yingvild. From the ruin, Arondil amassed a small force of undead Draugr, which he's been using to capture and kill local women, and proceed to do some, well, not-so-advertiser-friendly things with their enslaved spirits. Of course, you do get a chance to confront Arondil, and put an end to his sick games. That said, he's often a bit of a pain to defeat. Sure, he's no ebony warrior or karstag, but Arondil's certainly stronger than your average Ultmer. On top of that, during your battle with him, you'll also have to fight many of the spirits he's enslaved, only adding to the difficulty. Well, did you know, there's actually a way you can sort of free many of these ghosts from Arondil's influence, and in fact cause them to revolt against their former tormentor. You see, Arondil can be found sitting on his throne deep within the dungeon. He'll be guarded by the enthralled spirit of an unfortunate girl but not too far away from them both, will strangely enough lie a soul gem, sitting atop of a pressure plate and a pillar. If your character is good enough at sneaking, and you're able to make your way to this pillar without being detected, which is very difficult might I add, and you steal the soul gem that sits atop of it, Arondil's ghosts will turn on him, seemingly being liberated from his grasp, and now seeking revenge. Without the soul gem, this high elf apparently holds no power over the spirits. The ensuing fight, assuming you don't join in, will surprisingly be a bit of a toss-up. Sometimes Arondil will emerge on top, defeating his former subjects, and other times the spirits will successfully overpower him. But it will always be entertaining nonetheless. And even if Arondil does win, he'll just be that much weaker when you're finally ready to finish him off, and avenge all of those he's wronged. Coming in at number 3, whenever the player is killed, the camera will always briefly enter third person for a few seconds, so you can view your ragdolling corpse and accompanying death animation, before Skyrim automatically cuts and reloads your most recent save game, oftentimes before your body stops moving or death animation completes. At times, I found this to be very frustrating, especially when my character dies in a particularly funny or awkward manner, such as a long fall or being launched by a giant's club and I want to see just how far my guy's body will be launched or keep bouncing around before Bethesda automatically decides I've had enough. Well, believe it or not, there's a fairly easy way to avoid this and not have the camera cut out. Shortly before dying, or even after dying, just before the camera cuts, simply delete your most recent save, and Skyrim will not automatically reload one for you, 
allowing you to witness just how far that Giants Club swing took you in its full duration. And whenever you're done soaking it all in, just load a save back up. Now, admittedly, this may technically be a bit of a bug, but I prefer to think of it as a feature. For a fourth spot, adoptions have become a pretty significant mechanic within Skyrim, especially after the addition of the Hearthfire DLC. Adopt and raise a number of unfortunate children in your image, saving them from the harsh streets and allowing them to live in what are essentially palaces and own pets and play with swords. What a life you're giving these people. But did you know, believe it or not, the player can actually adopt an adult. Meet Asbjorn Firetamer. He's a Nord working as the apprentice to Balamund, owner of the Scorched Hammer blacksmith in Riften. According to in-game dialogue you can overhear, Balamund adopted Asbjorn himself from Honorhall Orphanage and took him under his wing. Now Asbjorn lives with and works for his adopted father at his business. You can probably already see where I'm going with this. If the Dragonborn has an amulet of Mara and is able to successfully become friendly with Balamund, this is usually accomplished through a quest he offers to get him 10 fire salts for his forge, you'll be able to marry him. This will result in Asbjorn effectively becoming your stepson. He's one of the only NPCs this can be performed on without the Hearthfire DLC. And to my knowledge, the only adult you can actually adopt, in a way. After marrying Balamund, you'll have to choose whether or not you want to live with him at his forge, or if you want him to move in with you. If you choose the latter of those two options, sometimes things get a little weird. Either Asborn will simply stay at the forgery alone, or every now and then on very rare occasions, he'll move in with you two, making it all the more family-like. And finally, last on our list, I'd like to introduce you to Nets Jelly, in case you haven't been already. It's an interesting alchemical ingredient, with a bit more uses than most. With the Dragonborn DLC, you'll be able to purchase it at vendors, or murder Netches to death to acquire this strange jam. What makes Nets Jelly so special is that it's the only ingredient that has paralysis as its primary effect. You see, every ingredient in the game has a small handful of effects, such as restore health, increase magicka, you get the idea. But generally, in order to get these effects, you'll have to mix the ingredient into a greater potion. However, as we've discussed in a previous video, each ingredient has a primary effect that can be reaped simply by eating it as is, raw, no potion required. And Nets Jelly just so happens to be the only ingredient that causes paralysis as its primary effect. This means whenever you consume Nets Jelly, you will indeed paralyze yourself for a few seconds. Eating Nets Jelly seems to be the only way to do this, as potions with the paralysis effect end up becoming poisons and can't be consumed by the player. And paralysis spells simply are never used by hostile NPCs. As it turns out though, paralyzing yourself actually has some advantages. If you consume Nets Jelly shortly before hitting the ground after a long fall, it will in fact negate any potential fall damage you may receive, sparing you a potentially very annoying death. This will come with the humorous side effect of allowing you to get to witness your character bounce around for a few seconds in some very, let's just say, unnatural ways. So maybe it wouldn't hurt to keep one or two bowls of this stuff on you at all times. Think of it as a magical parachute that forgets the slowing down part. Anyway, with that, we're going to wrap up. Five more things you didn't know you could do in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Which of these are you most excited to try out for yourselves? And what are some fun things you've discovered in Skyrim that other players may not have yet? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Thanks for stopping by, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.